Code Emotion. All right, we're good to go. Uh, so, hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Berman, and before I start, I have a quick favor. Uh, so, I have a 15-year-old daughter, an uh, aspiring web developer, uh, who uh, couldn't come. She has school, and I can't take her out of school for a week. I could, but uh, the U.S. doesn't really like that that much. So, she's at home, very sad. So, quick favor, can everybody stand up real quick? Just real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. And can you act like you're giving me a hug? I love the idea. And that would be great. Just look at me, act like you're giving me a hug. Yeah, one, two, three. Y'all the best. I love Rome. She sends you a hug back. Yeah, so I'll send her that picture. She'll be really happy. Uh, she's in school right now, so they're about five hours behind us. So I think she just started. Um, so I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. In the area, I, uh, I organize a handful of, of uh, conferences and meetup groups. Uh, I run the front-end developer group in Charlotte, uh, as well as the user experience group. Um, I also love preprocessors. I work with Chris Epstein and uh, Gina Bolton on the SASH project. Uh, so we're working on rebranding the entire website. This is the new logo. It's nice and pretty, kind of sassy. So uh, that should be launching here in the next few months. Uh, we'll have stickers and t-shirts and, and hoodies and lots of really cool stuff to kind of promote SAS. Uh, I also really enjoy cupcakes. I have a, a, an incredible sweet tooth. Uh, these are really fantastic chocolate mousse cupcakes, the best. I also love micro brewed root beer. Um, Virgil's is, is really good if you're ever in the States. I love it. And I love traveling. I love traveling to Ecuador, which is where my wife is from. Um, so I speak Spanish, uh, which is why I'm really excited to come to Rome because it sounds kind of like Spanish, but kind of not. So I can understand some of the things that you say when you're talking in Italian, but not enough. So I need to work on my Italian. But this is Cuenca. It is my most favorite city to visit in Ecuador. And uh, most recently, I was the uh, user experience director at Hendrick Automotive Group. Uh, so I had an interesting role there. Uh, it's a large company in the, in the US, uh, specifically in the southern part. And you know, uh, they were uh, an 8,000 employee company. Uh, they had billions of dollars in revenue. And they had zero web designers about eight or nine months ago. Uh, so they hired me as user experience director to come on and create a product development team. Uh, and the goal with the team was to create uh, a cross-discipline team uh, of designers, information architects, strategists, developers, uh, start an internship program or apprenticeship program. And that's been my life for the last eight or nine months. And what I want to share with you today is uh, rapid prototyping with SAS, Compass, and Middleman. Uh, SAS is a preprocessor for CSS. Uh, Compass is a framework built on top of SAS. And uh, Middleman is a static site generator written in Ruby. Uh, so this is a, a small portion of the process that we created uh, to take a, a cross-discipline team and have them work together to make products. Uh, so I really enjoy, you know, my background is, is design. Uh, I also do fairly heavy development on the front end side. Um, and I like having my hands in everything. Uh, so it, it was a really exciting opportunity to work with uh, various disciplines uh, to create lots of nifty products. Uh, so one of the things to keep in mind is, is one of our goals uh, working at Hendrick uh, is that the, the idea that we had is that everything we build uh, were web apps. Um, is the, the Italian OK? Not sure. OK, not sure. Uh, so th this is supposed to be the, the medium of the web. Medium, may I work? That's better? All right. So the, the medium of the web. Uh, so for us, the medium of the web is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Everything we create uh, is a web application, whether it's mobile or desktop. Uh, and that is the end result of what we build. Uh, so we want to get there as, uh, as quick as humanly possible. So the the, the idea, or the, uh, a couple of the goals that we had, uh, was to create uh, a really light process 
and to make sure that the various disciplines collaborated together. Uh, with, with the end goal to get to the medium of the web or get to HTML, CSS, and, and JavaScript as quick as humanly possible. Uh, that's what we wanted to do. So these are some of the things that we, we adopted to, to kind of make that happen. Um, so I, I come from a background working in, I, I think I've had 12 jobs in the last 10 years uh, at either startups, small companies, publishing companies, large corporations. Uh, I jump around a lot. Uh, I'm kind of ADD when it comes to jobs. Um, and I like finding interesting challenges all the time. And I tend not to stick around more than a year or two. Uh, so in, in the, the various jobs uh, that I've worked at, in various roles, uh, this is a typical process that, um, that tends to happen. Uh, so th there's this investigation portion uh, where you're trying to find out what the problems are, the things that you're trying to build, uh, and you end up creating documentation to support all this stuff. Um, each step is generally an individual that specializes in something. This is their role. This is what they do in the company. Uh, so there are people in companies, uh, typically on the UX side or strategy side, that, that take all the business rules and, and make this happen. Um, uh, so after that, uh, there are typically uh, some business rules. That probably doesn't translate correctly, but hey, it's the thought that counts. Uh, there are typically business rules are, are different problems that you're trying to solve for that come from marketing or the business group uh, or the, the, the company CEO. These are the things that we have problems and I want you to solve. Uh, which is another documentation. Um, and then wireframe, does that translate? Yeah. Yes, I got one right. So uh, another step is wireframes. Uh, and I typically despise wireframes. I don't like doing them, don't like working with them uh, because it creates more documentation. And, and in the case of wireframes, it creates a lot of documentation. Uh, next up, they're typically prototypes of some sort. Uh, if you work with the user experience team, uh, they might do various types of prototypes, whether it be paper prototypes, uh, something in Axure, which is pretty popular in the corporate world in, in the U.S. Um, so again, you have more documentation. Uh, and then you know, there are simply content specs. Uh, there's a copy team. They're writing all the content for you, kind of separate, uh, and they send you the content docs uh, for everything in the site, uh, which is more documentation. Um, and then if there's a visual design team, uh, while somebody's making content, somebody's making wireframes, they'll typically take those and they'll make Photoshop comps, uh, or, or mockups in Photoshop, really high fidelity. Um, and they basically take the wireframes in most cases, and, and they paint to create a Photoshop mockup. Um, I also dislike Photoshop mockups. I'm not a huge fan, uh, because what ends up happening is you have another piece of documentation. Um, and it ends up being a lot of really static documentation that doesn't really get you very much closer to working in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it, uh, it makes me crazy uh, because you're doing all of this stuff, uh, but you still don't have a product. Uh, you, you have nothing really tangible that somebody can open up in a browser or on a mobile site uh, and actually use. And in some cases, all that stuff, it takes months and months and months before anything is really ever done. So again, the goal uh, with our team is to get to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as quick as humanly possible. So this is kind of our, our quick process uh, that we put together. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of it. That is a separate talk for another occasion. Um, but typically, we, we observe and we analyze. We, we do some of that, that wayfinding in the beginning uh, to try and figure out what we're trying to create. Um, we build which is the portion that I'm going to focus on today, which is design and development. I have no idea how to say those in, in, in Italian. I'm assuming, I don't know, design in Italian? Design. design. That's what Google Translate said, but it, it, it was too close to English, so I was confused. And, and then development. Oh, yeah. Yes, I need to talk to you all more. Um, then there's, there, there's uh, ship it, which is taking what you've built and getting it out to people so they can actually use. Uh, and, and in our case, and in the case of most products, you have to inform and educate the folks that are going to be using it. If it's something new, uh, if there are changes or additions to your software. Uh, and then last, uh, the, the piece that uh, some startups or companies tend to forget is you have to maintain what you build. You can't just launch it, have people use it, and never touch it again. Uh, so that, that was the last piece of our process, just make sure that it continues to happen. So like I said, 
uh, I'm going to be talking about the construction phase, actually building stuff. Um, I much prefer doing than talking about doing. Uh, it makes me happy. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. So in, in the construction phase, uh, there are a handful of things that we did. We did wireframes, um, but not the kind of wireframes that I dislike. Uh, typical wireframes have uh, lots of documentation associated with them that explain functionality and interactions and what's supposed to be where. Um, and none of it's very useful to, to me. Uh, so our type of wireframes, we have uh, fairly large whiteboards or we have notebooks. Um, and I, I think there's no better substitute than a pencil and paper or marker and a whiteboard. Um, it allows everybody co to contribute, to come together, uh, to work together as a team. It doesn't matter if you're a designer or a developer or a content person or the boss. Uh, everybody can come together and they can work to uh, hash out problems. Uh, so th this is just a really simple wireframe uh, from a, call, uh, a project that we called What Up. Um, my boss wanted to know who we were at and what we were doing. Uh, we telecommuted a fair bit. Um, so there were times where we were trying to schedule a meeting and nobody was in the office. Like, where is everybody at? Uh, so we created a, a really simple app that tied into Campfire. Uh, enclosure, if you want to write Enclosure, nobody, maybe? No closure yet? It's kind of new. New stuff coming out. They just released a new um, uh, front end framework enclosure at ClosureCon West uh, like two days ago. So something kind of nifty. Uh, so we created just a really simple app. So the wireframes, this is the actual real deal. Uh, so anybody can go into Campfire and go, hi, I'm, uh, this is what I'm working on, or this is where I'm at, or I'm available or unavailable. Uh, so for everybody in the office, uh, my boss or me could see who's where and what they're doing. Something really simple. And then uh, we do rapid prototyping, which is what the rest of this talk is going to focus on. That's why you're here, right? Uh, so in our rapid prototyping process, there are really four things that we focused on. Uh, we focused on pairing. Uh, we wanted our designers and our developers and our strategy folks to be working together on, on problems. Um, one of the requirements that we had is that everybody had to learn or at least know HTML and CSS, at least at a basic level. Uh, we wanted to empower everybody on the team to be able to take their ideas and, and make something. Uh, so we worked a lot with that with pairing. Uh, another thing is that we focused on components. Uh, we focused on building systems uh, so that we were lazy. Uh, we, we, anything that we had to redo over and over again, we didn't want to do over and over again. So we created a system of components. Um, and then in our, our rapid prototyping, uh, we have two sections uh, that, that basically sum up our CSS. Uh, we have a scaffold. Uh, which I'll show you in a second, uh, which basically just takes care of the visual layout, but not necessarily the, the prettiness uh, of how it looks. And then we have the theme that takes care of the, the visual ooey gooeyness of, of the, the visual UI. Uh, so we keep those separate in our CSS. So this is an app that we did called Pole Position. We were a, a, a NASCAR related company to a sense. So we had Pole Position and uh, we created a simple app to go into GitHub, look at all of our projects, take out all the milestones, and kind of decide which was our current milestone, how far along it was, how many issues there were, who was working on the project, what was the last completed milestone, what is the next upcoming milestone. Uh, something kind of simple so we could track at a high level all the projects they were working on and uh, how far along they were. So this is the gray box version. So this is what we use in our scaffold. Uh, so uh, the typical process is that we take a sketch. Uh, we use our framework to, to rapid prototype it out. Uh, but we don't care too much about the visual design yet. Um, for, for us, that's the least important part. Uh, the most important thing for us, again, is to get to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It doesn't have to look pretty. Uh, but it needs to visually look OK. So we use a, a model of gray boxing. Everything's just black and white. Uh, with shades of gray. Um, so we can get the content out, get functionality built in, um, and just get basic visual structure set up. So this lives in our scaffold file. Uh, then we actually layer on the UI. So we make it look nice, uh, add all this stuff in the theme, add images that we want. Um, so it kind of looks nice and pretty. It's a little bit dark on this, but uh, it looks much better on a screen. Uh, next. Uh, like I said, we don't use a lot of uh, full Photoshop mockups. 
uh, we use something called style tiles. Um, Samantha Warren, uh, a fantastic designer at Twitter, uh, kind of coined the term and came up with the idea behind it. Uh, they're almost like the web version of mood boards. Uh, so we use style tiles. Uh, here's the website if you want to check it out. She has templates and information. It's fantastic. Uh, especially if you're like me and don't like digging into Photoshop every day, all day, to create something that you didn't have to recreate again in HTML and CSS. Don't like it. So we use style tiles. Uh, this is kind of how they would look in, in our, the way we use them. Uh, so they define colors. Uh, they define visual elements of the site. Uh, they define our grid system, uh, how we're going to use our headings. Uh, they define our content, various pieces of content, how we're going to do tables, uh, how we're going to handle our baseline, things like block quotes. Um, and then we also start designing out specific elements. So we don't want to do a full page and then do an element on every single page. Uh, we just do the element. We can, we can abstract that out at a much higher level. Uh, so this is just a really simple example of using like messages boxes for, for errors, uh, warnings, just basic notifications. Uh, so we can see how they would look. Uh, now this is already working and functional in the, the scaffold, the, the gray box version. It just doesn't look quite as pretty. Uh, so this gives the front end developers, uh, it's a way to translate visual design to front end without having to do a lot of really hefty, meaningless visual design that can either be taken and implemented by the designer if he can do front end, or passed along to the developer uh, so he can take the hex values and the, the various details and implement that in, on, on the front end. So style tiles. Uh, next is critique. Uh, if anybody a design student or study design? Couple? Uh, so in most design schools, they have critiques. Uh, so you, you design your work, they critique fairly heavily. Um, sometimes it's kind of painful, but in most cases it's beneficial. Uh, so we try and build that into our process because we think it's really important uh, to get together and, and to critique functionality, uh, critique how things are, are, are working, talk about our visual design system. Um, and it gives a chance for the developers to learn more about design uh, while our designers are learning more about development during our pairing sessions. And there's kind of a repeat. So it's a continual iterative process. We constantly do the same things over and over again. But it's a lot of fun and it's lighter and it includes everybody. So now let's talk about the rapid prototyping part. That's the fun stuff. All right. So in our, our uh, rapid prototyping, like I said, uh, we do a lot with Ruby. We're primarily a Ruby shop. Uh, we work a lot with either Rails, Sinatra, Web Machine. Uh, those are the ones that we prefer. Um, not a huge Rails fan. It's gotten kind of weird and magical, even more so over the last year. Uh, but yeah, I love Ruby. I'm a designer you know, by, by training. So it makes sense to my designer brain that I can actually look at Ruby and read it and write it myself. Uh, we use Sinatra, uh, again, like I said. And we use something called Middleman. Uh, so Middleman is a static site generator built on top of Sinatra. Uh, it's rack-based, uh, so it gives you access to all kinds of rack goodies. Um, and since everything that we do is built in Rails, either in Sinatra as a, a full Sinatra app or a Rails app or in Web Machine, the, the static assets, the CSS, the, the JavaScript, the, uh, the, the uh, HTML, the layouts, the templates, all that stuff can translate almost directly into our, our real full stack applications. Uh, so it's a really easy transition from our, our rapid prototype to the real app. Uh, we use Slim. Again, I'm lazy, really, really lazy. So I use uh, preprocessors like a crazy person. Uh, so Slim is kind of a nicer version of Hamel. Uh, it makes writing HTML more concise. Uh, you don't have to worry about closing all your tags. It'll do it for you. And again, I'm a SAS fan. We do Ruby stuff. I love SAS. It's a CSS version. I use Compass as well, which is uh, basically a CSS3 mixed-in library. Uh, so instead of having to write border radius for all the different vendor prefix stuff or Flexbox, which is soon to be coming and, and used by all, um, Compass handles all that for me, so I don't have to think about it. I just do one line and it writes everything for me. I love it. Uh, they also have a handful of Ruby functions built in uh, to make things like spriting easier to generate all your sprites automatically. Uh, just a few lines of code and it handles it. Uh, and then for grid systems, I use SUSE. SUSE is a really nice, responsive 
um, fluid grid system uh, built on top uh, of Compass and SAS. We use jQuery. Again, I'm lazy, it makes it easy. Uh, if I was using uh, a mobile app, I'd probably use Zepto. Uh, it's a fair bit lighter, not quite as heavy. Uh, and then I use CoffeeScript. I love CoffeeScript. Again, I'm lazy, it makes it easy. It looks kind of like Ruby. I dig it. All right, so if you're not a Ruby shop, don't fear, there are other options. Uh, there's a static site generator in almost any language. Uh, there are a lot in Ruby. Uh, there are a handful of no, in No, there's some in PHP. Uh, there might be some in .NET. I'm not as connected in, in that world of stuff. But uh, there are a handful, just in case you want to tinker. Uh, you know, if you use Node a lot, you can use Stylus, uh, which I dig, or you can use Less, which is like the light version of a CSS preprocessor. Uh, and then uh, I have to mention libsass. Uh, so one of the, the, the complaints in the community is that SAS is Ruby only, and you have to run Ruby if you want to use it, and you kind of do. Uh, so Hampton Catlin, uh, one of the original IDA guys behind SAS uh, years and years ago, uh, came out with something called libsass. So they've been rewriting the, the Ruby library to, to have it in C. Uh, so it's a system level library. Uh, and then they've created wrappers uh, to, to wrap the C library. Uh, so it'll work on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And then you just have wrappers for Python, Ruby, Node, PHP, .NET. It's a much better implementation. And it's so much faster. Uh, then there's Hamel. Again, it's another HTML preprocessor. Uh, Jade, again, if you use Node, uh, Jade is a fantastic uh, HTML preprocessor for, for Node. All right, so creating modular systems. Uh, one of the things that, that we tried to, to really to do or, or do create components. Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. Uh, so we tried to create a system of components. Uh, we didn't want to just create this gargantuan huge system uh, that we'd have to use everywhere. We wanted to modularize, modularize our modules. So we created components. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is Bower from Twitter. Um, it's a browser package manager that kind of helps take components and make them work together as individual pieces. Um, it, it's interesting. I kind of like it. Uh, if you're doing a lot of really heavy JavaScript stuff, this is really cool. Uh, it allows you to create packages, uh, define version numbers, any dependencies that your package has. Uh, so in our case, a lot of our JavaScript require jQuery. So we can define jQuery and what version is a dependency, which makes it really useful. Uh, but in our case, uh, we use Compass a lot. Uh, Compass has a fairly extensive um, extension framework built into it. Uh, so since everything that we do is in, is in Ruby, uh, we want to be able to take our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript component, uh, gemify it, turn it into a gem, uh, give that gem a version so we could put that on our own internal gem server. So what that allows us to do is to take a single component, um, and then we can use it anywhere uh, by version number. So we can use it either in our uh, rapid prototyping framework, we can use it in Rails, we can use it in Sinatra, we can use it <clears throat> in web machine, doesn't matter. As long as it can run gems, uh, we can use our components. And it, we, we end up creating about, uh, I don't know, 30 to 35 of these things um, that we could use across all of our projects. And so they take care of the functionality, the, the basic scaffold, um, any of the themes are taken care of per project. So that's what we do, and this is what we use. Uh, so we created something called Test Track again. It's NASCAR oriented. So we, we created a Test Track uh, rapid prototyping framework. Uh, and the, the way it works, this is middleman at its base. Uh, we use everything important that you mess with is in the source directory. But in the, the there's a basic Ruby config file that takes care of the, the layout engine that we're using, in our case, we use Slim. Uh, we also use Markdown, primarily for our content. Uh, this is really handy to hand off to, to content writers uh, that may not be as savvy in HTML and CSS. Uh, they can grasp Markdown pretty quick. Uh, so instead of them handing you a bunch of Word docs that are just poorly formatted, you can teach them to write in Markdown in about an hour. And they can give you nice, formed, Markdown documents that can be translated to HTML. Uh, so th there's a CSS processing session. So we, we want to require Susie, and then we also tell it how we're going to have Compass compile our stuff. 
Uh, then you can define pages and all odds and ends. Uh, and we're actually experimenting with KISS uh, to automatically generate our style guides. And you can create helpers uh, that just make things kind of simple and easy. And uh, then you just define your directories. So you can define where your assets are for your style sheets, JavaScript, and uh, your images. Uh, and then you can do a lot of really nifty things with the build. So in the build, uh, you can automatically minify your CSS, minify and concatenate your JavaScript together. Uh, there's a cache buster. And uh, there's also a, a smusher gem that will take all of your images and optimize them. So it rips out all the extra metadata that you don't really need and makes them nice and small. So it does a lot of really cool things out of the box. So let's look at the source directory. Uh, this is the way we typically set up our projects. Uh, and it mimics almost one-to-one -one how we do things in Rails or Sinatra. Uh, so we have an assets directory, which is for our components, our static assets. Uh, we have our layouts. And again, this translates to Rails. Uh, that takes care of the various layouts that we're going to be using throughout the site. We typically have one or two. We don't have many. Uh, and then the style guide, which is just kind of there right now. Now, in our layouts, uh, we have a primary. We also have one for our, our style guide. You can create as many as you want. You can create them for your home page. You can create one for an article page. Uh, you can create one for whatever you think of. Uh, when you have multiple pages on a site that have kind of the same wrapper but just a little bit different, uh, you can create a new layout for it. It makes it easy to maintain. Um, and then uh, we have images, JavaScripts, and style sheets, uh, which make things pretty handy. Uh, in your images folder, we separate our images into two folders, uh, one that is content and one that is for layout. Uh, and we try and mimic that across all our apps, just to make sure we're keeping layouts separate from content. And uh, you know, our JavaScripts, we have our, our standard libraries, whether it's jQuery, Modernizer, Selectivizer. All that stuff goes in our libs. Uh, then we have our modules, which is our, our components that we've created. Um, and I'm just going to show you, show them all of you, show them to all of you here, uh, to make it easy. Uh, and then we have our base JS and our modules. So our base. Uh, is where uh, a handful of our, our work goes. So when we're writing JavaScript that's not in a module that's just specific to an app, it would go in base. And then our modules concatenates everything that's in our modules directory. Uh, yeah, that stuff, that's fine. Uh, so if you were looking at our JavaScript, this is kind of what you would see. So we create modules for uh, accordions, badges, carousels, dates, drop downs, forms, messaging. And it kind of continues. All these small, tiny pieces of, of functional HTML, CSS, or JavaScript live in their own component. So this is something, so we, we would create basically a carousel's uh, compass extension uh, and take the HTML and CSS and JavaScript that would go to make a carousel, uh, create a gem, and stick it in our gem store so we can use it wherever we want. Uh, in our style sheets, uh, there's a lot of magic that happens here that this is my preferred way to do it. You can instruct this however you want, but this is how we do it. Uh, so we have a module directory, again, mimicking what we do in JavaScript. Uh, we have a folder for responsive stuff. Everybody does responsive now, so we have responsive stuff. Uh, we also have something that takes care of structure. Uh, structure takes care of things like our grid system, typography. Um, it, this is where our variables and our mix-ins live. Uh, and then we have a base CSS file, um, which concatenates all that stuff, and I'll show you in a second. We have a print file. We have our scaffold. Now, this is where a lot of the heavy lifting goes uh, to create the overall visual structure of a specific app. And then our theme just takes some of those same classes that we use in our, our scaffold and makes them look nice and pretty. So this is our structure. Again, grid icons, mix-ins. Uh, we use normalize, typography, any utility classes that we may have, uh, variables. Uh, typical responsive breakpoints that we keep in separate files. Uh, and then modules, uh, this almost mimics one-to-one -to, -one to our JavaScript, to the JavaScript side of things. Uh, there may be components that are CSS only. There may be components that are JavaScript only. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then this is our base CSS. We actually don't write any CSS in here at all. Uh, the only thing that we're doing is we're importing all of our other CSS into this one file. Uh, so it takes care of everything in structure, all the modules that we decide to use. Uh, in this case, we can uncomment or comment, uh, comment out or uncomment the modules that we just want to use on a specific project. So we don't have everything. 
so we can kind of pick and choose. And uh, we have our media queries here on the bottom, uh, so we load them last. Uh, so this isn't really a talk about writing modular CSS architecture, for end architecture. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, uh, Jonathan Snook uh, wrote a really fantastic book uh, about scalable and modular architecture in CSS. It is fantastic. Uh, it will change the way you write CSS. Uh, he has a really fantastic way of doing it. It's nice and short. Most of it's actually online. Uh, so you can get it online. Just look for it. Uh, it's called SMAX. That, that's his abbreviation. All right. So um, if you don't want to build your own framework uh, and want to get an idea how other people are doing it, yes. You use Foundation? Yeah, Foundation is great. Foundation is built by the guys at Zurb. Uh, it is built on top of SAS. Uh, it is mobile first. Uh, even if you don't use it, it's fantastic to just kind of pull down the Git repository and peruse through what they've been doing. They're doing some really interesting things. Um, and it's a great way to start. So they have a lot of pre-built components for you. Uh, they're not separated out into separate components. They, you just download the system and get the system. Uh, you don't get to choose what you use yet. Uh, Rock Hammer just came out by uh, Andy Clark uh, from the UK. Uh, fantastic guy. There was an app that came out uh, I don't know, probably about six months ago called Hammer. Uh, and Hammer is a really great way to work with preprocessors and kind of maintain and use static sites. Uh, so he built something based off Twitter Bootstrap, uh, translated everything to SAS, but built it so it works directly with Hammer for Mac. Uh, so he calls it Rock Hammer. Uh, it's something else that's fun to work with. Uh, if you're not very command line savvy, it's a really fantastic GUI uh, and a framework that you can use that way. Uh, so this is Hammer the app. It's nice and pretty easy to use. It'll compile all your preprocessed stuff for you. Uh, Bootstrap, this is probably the most popular framework out there. Uh, they have, they've done a lot of really great work. They've uh, been updating this thing like uh, a lot. Uh, Twitter's doing a lot of really cool stuff. And again, it's great to peruse through. They have a handful of really great components and modules that you can look at. Uh, they're doing interesting things with JavaScript. Um, it's really great for rapid prototyping. Um, it's OK for production. You could probably optimize the JavaScript a fair bit more. But um, definitely good to tinker with. So again, uh, the, the whole goal of all this is to create a light process so you can actually do things, make things, get them out as soon as you can. Um, and then to help collaboration between the different disciplines, uh, to help collaboration between designers, developers, content folks, uh, everybody on the team. So it's all inclusive. Um, one of the biggest hazards with, with companies is that we tend to gravitate towards our own specialization. Uh, towards, you know, if, if I'm a designer, I hang out with other designers. If I'm a developer, I hang out with other developers. Uh, if, if I'm a content person, I hang out with other content people because we get each other. Um, it's great for your own specialization, not so great for the team. Uh, so uh, using a rapid prototyping process, uh, if you choose it to be, it can be extremely inclusive. Uh, it can help people on the team work together, get to know each other, uh, learn about each other's disciplines, um, and it makes things a lot more fun. So again, the goal may not be very concise in Italian, but the goal is to get to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as quick as humanly possible. And we use rapid prototyping to do that. Um, so questions? Any at all? All right. Uh, about the stuff for the uh, You say it's, it's useful to use a framework to get quicker to the, to the solution. Mm -hmm. But is that the starting point to develop the final product, or is it just a prototype and then you start over developing uh, in a larger way the, the website? OK. Uh, so make sure you understand his question. His question was, uh, using a rapid prototyping system, is that primarily just to get to a prototype? Um, and then can or can it not be used in the actual application or, or the final version? Um, it, it depends. I mean, uh, a prototype by its nature is built to be thrown away. I mean, it, it's a prototype. Uh, in our case, uh, again, we're lazy. We, we don't like having to redo work. Uh, uh, the, the component system allows us to uh, prototype out specific interactions or layouts and use them or just throw them away, uh, which is nice. I mean, I mean don't, for your, don't be afraid to throw away code. But if there's something that we can use and transition over to our application, that's what we want to do. So usually this framework is maybe strictly, strictly, so you can uh, edit that to reach uh, the what you can reach uh, do by starting over. 
right? And that's, so one of the reasons that we, we didn't just take something like foundation or bootstrap is that they don't have separate components. You can't just choose, I want this and I want that, but I don't want all this other stuff. You get everything. So we wanted to create components. Uh, so we, we could choose, we want a carousel here, we want a slider there, we don't want anything else. Uh, so our solution to that was, was using compass extensions and using gems. Easy for us. Uh, you can use something like Twitter's Bower to do the same thing on the, uh, we just JavaScript to kind of include all that stuff. Um, Bower works kind of like uh, a Ruby gem for the most part, except it's just JavaScript based. Right. So foundation is one of those. Foundation is doing some great stuff. I mean, they really are. So yeah, yeah. And the, the version four is a uh, really nice. Uh, it is. It, it it's really nice. <laughs> I mean, well, one of the things that they're trying to do. I mean, Twitter's trying to do this. jQuery is even doing this. Is they're trying to make all these frameworks more modular, so you can choose what you want. Kind of like Modernize will let you do. Uh, so that that'll probably be coming hopefully within the next few months. I hope. Uh, it'll make them, I think, a bit more useful. So you don't just get everything. You can just kind of pick and choose. Uh, I was just wondering if you must get it only for the foundation framework. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering uh, if you had experience with the application uh, with the last prototype with some production environment to be able to generate those. So his question is, is there a way to translate uh, a prototype into production? Like a middleman. Yeah, like a middleman into uh, production. I mean, he, uh, so the... Yeah, so his question then is, uh, is there a way to take something like middleman or static site generator and kind of take that and e either write something programmatically to, to, to translate it into the application? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could probably script something to, to take files and move them over. Uh, there's always going to be uh, some manual labor involved in taking the, the rapid prototype and, and kind of moving it to pr into like a production or, or a server setting into like the real app. Um, if you're going Sinatra to Sinatra, it's not too bad uh, because that's what middleman's built in and it's rack based. Um, but the, the thing to remember here is that your, uh, wh where an app is typically calling and generating a bunch of pages, uh, you can kind of do that with middleman, but what, it, what it's generating is static HTML for every single page that you create. Um, so that there is really no database. Uh, you can use YAML to automate the creation of pages, um, which kind of works. You, know, you, you could probably take some of that and, and move it to like a, a database type thing, but it, it's, uh, sometimes you just use it for primarily prototyping. Uh, in, in our case, we allow or ask our, the, the front end designers are working on the prototype while the developers are doing things like working on the database schema, getting servers set up, and eventually somewhere we meet in the middle and take what we've been doing in the prototype and move it directly to the app. Um, so we, we don't, we typically don't do everything in the prototype. Uh, we use it as a playground uh, until our developers get something up and running and that we can actually start using there. So your question is, do we show the, the static prototypes to the, the clients, for example? Um, sometimes. It depends. At Hendrick, we were kind of lucky. Uh, all of our clients were internal. We weren't an agency. Uh, we built things for the company. Uh, in an agency setting, uh, our deliverables would probably be um, maybe some of the initial wireframes to let them know. Uh, th these are the thoughts that we have. Uh, what do you think? Uh, we would definitely show them style tiles. Uh, you would have to get sign off on the visual look and feel. Uh, so typically you would create those style tiles with your client. 
uh, to, to get an idea of, of, of what they thought or how they pictured the business and then what's your interpretation of that um, visually. Uh, and then you would definitely have them walk through the rapid prototype um, because that's, that's something that you can show them. So that's all the time we have. Thanks, everybody. If you have questions, you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm Berman Painter. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>